It's wonderful to be here with all of you. Thank you so much, Dame Annette. Thank you so much, June. Uh, I acknowledge uh, our hosts, the Gumach people who are traditional owners of this space, Gachambal, where each year that Gama is held, we learn more and more from our younger teachers. And this morning we were very privileged to hear from uh, the younger teachers who've led uh, the reforms and changes here uh, since the 1970s. Uh, well, since the mission days, in fact. So thank you very much to all the Yolngu teachers and educators. I learn from you every time I hear you speak. So, as you know, I work at the University of Melbourne and I wanted to say a few words about uh, our uh, curriculum project. I believe there's a PowerPoint. And uh, we'll move straight on to the next slide. Uh, thanks, Chris. So, uh, uh, Indigenous Knowledges in Breadth Subject, slide three, and then on to slide four. So, we at the University of Melbourne have a target uh, of a thousand undergraduate and postgraduate students, Indigenous undergraduate and postgraduate students by 2029. When we set our last target of 500, we met it very easily, and I hope that we meet our target of 1,000 just as easily. And one of the reasons for this is that we use a pipeline strategy. Um, and unlike other universities, in every faculty of our university, and not only in our academic uh, work, but also in our professional work, uh, we have uh, teaching, research and engagement projects right across the university, and they are deeply embedded in our uh, teaching, our research, and in our partnerships with communities, such as our long-time partnership here with uh, the Yothi Indi Foundation. Our uh, goal uh, is to close the gap in education uh, on our, you know, in, 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 in any way that we can on our nine campuses and in our partnerships. So, as June explained to you, one of the key uh, ways of doing that is to incorporate Indigenous knowledge into our curricula. We're doing that at the University of Melbourne. For instance, this is a subject that I teach. Actually, I dumped my teaching on my associate professor, Michael Sean Fletcher, who's here somewhere um, this week. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, indigenous cultures and knowledges uh, and uh, in this subject, what we do is bring together not all, but most of our experts from across the faculties, from physics, uh, so the astronomer Dwayne Hamaker, from engineering, the engineering school's partnership with Budge Bim and the Gunditjmara people, uh, our research unit in indigenous languages who bring in their partners each year. Uh, the last time we taught it, the partners came from the Manangrida school and uh, education, uh, theatre and music, uh, and so on. And so it is our goal uh, that every undergraduate student will leave the University of Melbourne um, having had the opportunity to learn about Indigenous cultures and knowledges. And uh, I hope one day that indeed every student will take that opportunity. So uh, other faculties likewise have, have uh, uh, developed subjects, none, no, none more so than our Melbourne Graduate School of Education. So can we go to slide number um, uh, five, please? So some years ago, eight years ago in fact, uh, uh, I was assisted by a grant from the Commonwealth Government to establish the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Curricular Project. Uh, we are still working on it. Uh, we have a Tungarong name for it, granted by Auntie Lorraine Padgham, Nganga, which means knowing. Um, and we were also assisted by the Dara Foundation, and representatives of that foundation are here, so thank you very much for your support. It enabled us through the hardest times to continue work on this project. Uh, 
And if, next slide, please. Now, because we d don't have sufficient internet here, and that's, that's a big problem um, in many parts of remote and rural Australia, and uh, in the inner city as well. So one day somebody will improve the NBN um, <laughs> and, and internet coverage. Uh, but it's a serious issue. Our schools need internet coverage and they need good internet coverage. Uh, so we developed this online resource. The curricula project uh, is still called Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Curricula Online, uh, but uh, very soon in the, in the next month we'll put the correct title, Ngaranga, there, but you can uh, find our project online and you'll see that what we did uh, over before the pandemic was developed 42 resources that comply with the uh, previous uh, Australian curriculum framework and there's since been a review um, and uh, we are continuing our work uh, and to expand the resources. The resources cover from grade five uh, to uh, grade 12 and uh, they are grouped into three themes, uh, fire, water and astronomy. So they're ve three very important areas of Indigenous knowledge and under those areas we bring together Indigenous knowledge holders and uh, experts in the field. Each one of those resources can be taken by any teacher in Australia and taught in the classroom. Um, either in one class or throughout a semester. But what we need to do is to test these curricula in classrooms and we've been locked out of classrooms during the pandemic. So the next stage is to take our work into classrooms and test it with teachers and, and improve our work. We also want to take our curricula uh, into uh, our communities um, and learn from Indigenous knowledge holders about how to enrich our our offerings and make them more relevant uh, to Indigenous communities. The purpose of our curricular project is a nation building one. As June said, every Australian, and in particular every Australian student, is entitled to know the truth about our country. And at present, what they're taught in school bears no relationship or very little relationship to the truth. Now you can perhaps guess why we chose fire, water and astronomy as the th three Indigenous knowledge streams for our curricular development. If we had started with history and the frontier wars, our work would have been immediately rejected because there remains a denialist approach. Um, apparently all of you dropped out of a spaceship and landed here. <laughs> fully formed, <coughs> there was nobody ever here before, um, it was all yours, um, there was nobody before you who might have created it in the previous 65,000 years. That's about what you learn in school about us and our past and the country in which you live. I'm, I'm sorry for being cynical but I've been into many schools uh, I've looked at many curricula and I know that there are dedicated individual teachers here and there across the country who do their best, but they are often uh, in trouble with the principal, in trouble with the parents and uh, uh, the parents, you know, association um, and they're quickly moved on to another school or they are prevented from teaching their subjects and they certainly are not allowed to have texts in the library that might help. Um, and, uh, you know, we get emails from people saying, I was told by an Aboriginal person that I know that I should not read this book. And I think, oh, what book are they talking about? And, you know, you open it up and it's the Macquarie Junior Atlas of Indigenous Australia. I highly recommend it. Great book. If anybody says that to you, ignore them. It's a terrific book to share with children. And, in fact... If you go on any of the book sites, Booktopia, you know, and so on, um, or a good bookshop uh, website like Readings, and they've got the Readings Children Bookshop, just Google Indigenous or Aboriginal or First Nations, you will find 
so many children's books that you can take into the classroom right now. Uh, the, the, the numbers increase every month. So I just want to point that out to you because, you know, this. when we did our survey of teachers, when we began this project, what they said to us was, uh, there's no curriculum and we don't know what to teach and we're not sure that if we did teach it that it would be any good. How do we know that it's any good? Um, how do we know that Aboriginal people approve of it or Torres Strait Islander people approve of it? Uh, we already work too hard, we can't add any more to our curriculum. Um, I don't want to be accused of being racist. Um, and, and what has this got to do with uh, um, any of our subjects anyway? Uh, we have a curriculum, we don't need your input and so on and so forth. And uh, as June said, there are three cross-curriculum priorities. Australia and Asia, sustainability, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. Now, the three cross-curriculum priority are supposed to be compulsory. They are the, you know, the, the crosswinds of, the, of the, the teaching and learning areas to enrich our curriculum. Teachers have made up their own minds and said, oh no, only the first two are compulsory. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and history is not compulsory. Why would that be compulsory? So they took the curriculum uh, framework, which plainly states that the three cross-curriculum priority are compulsory, and they made up their own minds and said, no, nah, not that one. So uh, somebody tell me the definition of structural racism again. There it is. You know, there's an instance of structural racism. So across the country, teachers have decided that it's not compulsory, but Australia and Asia is, sustainability is. Uh, so we thought, how are we going to tackle this resistance that hides behind, you know, fear, quality assurance and so on? So we developed the 42 resources, developed by, as I say, Indigenous knowledge holders and experts so that the resources are right there. There's no work for teachers to do. You just download it from our website for free. Doesn't cost you anything, unlike all the stuff that they do buy, uh, which I'm not going to buy. $1,500 a pop for a school library? No, we, all of our resources are online for free. Now, if you have any questions, we've made it clear that you can contact us and we will assist. And so far, we have about six schools that have contacted us. Um, out of the, there's uh, 3,000 schools in Australia, I think that's right. Um, so we have a long way to go. And uh, developing curricula is much more difficult than the ordinary person might think so. You'll remember that in, under the previous government, uh, the education minister uh, wanted a particular version of ANZAC taught to students. Uh, what you may not remember is that earlier, he and other ministers of education in the previous 10 years had said that they don't think it's a good idea to teach Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures in schools because it's so divisive. It's so divisive. Um, and uh, it's difficult to tell the difference between their position and Pauline Hanson's position. Um, I, well, frankly, there is none. So, uh, for example, what, you know, the previous Minister for Education doesn't want you to know, and I believe he's now the opposition spokesperson for education. Um, what they don't want you to know is, for example, if we're going to learn about ANZAC, and we hope to get to this in the next tranche of curriculum development, uh, upwards of 1,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people served in wars and engagements for the Australian Defence Forces and the British Imperial Army dating right back to the Boer War. And in fact, the horse handlers in the light, uh, the first, um, you know, light brigade, the horse contingents in Gallipoli were Aboriginal men. Um, and that history was denied uh, absolutely until Brendan Nelson changed uh, the, you know, what you see at the War Memorial and he brought in Aboriginal staff and now you learn a little bit 
about the service of Aboriginal men and women in the Australian Defence Forces since the late 19th century. But in every engagement, there have been Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander service men and women. Um, they don't want you to know that Ujuru Nunakal served in um, uh, the European theatre as an ambulance driver during World War II. They don't want you to know about the Aboriginal pilot in the Air Force who also came from Queensland. Um, quietly and confidentially, I can tell you that there have been Victoria Cross winners from our people. Um, you will never learn about this in school. Why are Australian children denied 65,000 years of history and culture and denied even an accurate history of Australia's history since 1901 when the Commonwealth of Australia was formed. Uh, it's inexplicable that that should be the case. So our project is aimed at making sure that every Australian student learns something about Aboriginal histories and cultures and leaves school with an, you know, something of a, a rigorous understanding of who we are as peoples, the languages that we speak, uh, and our histories and cultures. Now, <clears throat> one of the things we weren't able to do was deal with languages in this first tranche because it's very difficult. So if you look at the gumbay.com.au website, which is uh, the First Nations Languages website, uh, constructed entirely by speakers of languages, there's between six and 800 language varieties now uh, across Australia. Uh, which, you know, this is a self-assertion by the speakers themselves. And, of course, it is uh, what linguists accept as, you know, a given in the mega-diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, or properly speaking, Australian languages. But what our research unit in Indigenous, in indigenous languages have, have done, and, and, again, this has been tremendously difficult but making huge progress, is the 50 Words Project. So just Google 50 words, and I think we're up to language number 35. You know, there's quite a few hundred to go, but if you, you can click on any one of those languages and hear 50 words in that language. So uh, eventually, every school in Australia will be able to look up the language in their area and play the words of that language spoken by an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander speak, speaker to their students, 35 regions can do so now, or linguistic regions can do so right now, and eventually we'll make it through to the six, 600 plus language varieties. Now, I'm going into a lot of detail, but what I really want to uh, tell you is, next slide please, Chris, is that we have a, uh, an approved plan now. Our project, I've moved our project into the Melbourne Graduate School of Education under the leadership of Associate Professor Melita Hogarth, a highly experienced Aboriginal educator. Um, I think she's Gamilaroi, I'm so bad with this. Um, but she did teach at Woorabinda School for a very, very long time. And uh, the Woorabinda is where my grandparent, grandfather and his twin brother were taken in the 1920s. So, you know, I, I was born and raised in Queensland, two generations away from the frontier, very, you know, within living memory of my grandmother and grandfather. So, Melita taught at the school where my people were removed to forcibly from the old Bundala Reserve. And uh, she has a very keen understanding of what it is that I'm trying to achieve. And because she's a highly qualified educator, she knows exactly how to test these resources. But of course, the big issue is, and June raised this, is how do we prepare teachers to do this? So we're developing um, professional certification for teachers as well. And so too is the wonderful Professor Peter Anderson at QUT uh, in Brisbane. Um, to comply with the, um, you know, the Australian teachers' standards, uh, 1.4 and 2.4, again compulsory, but totally ignored by the teaching professions and schools. Uh, but we're going to make these certification um, classes available to teachers, and uh, I, 
I hope that you'll be able to pay attention to how we develop this. Uh, can we go to slides eight and then nine, please, Chris? So Indigenous knowledge in initial teacher education, that's a subject that we're already teaching. Um, and then next slide. So uh, this is uh, Melita's work, developing a strengths-based approach, a place-responsive uh, approach, and a focus on truth-telling, so Indigenous knowledge is taught, practised, and assessed under the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers, as well as the cross-curriculum priority within the three-dimensional Australian um, <coughs> curricula. Um, and so we hope that, you know, this will become normalised across Australia. So we're the first to do it, and isn't that a tragedy? Here we are well into the 21st century, and we have to say that we've just, you know, this is the first time. So also we're under... Uh, now, an obligation throughout the university to incorporate Indigenous knowledge into all of our teaching. And so every faculty has an obligation to find a way to do that. And others here can talk to you about that. We have a wonderful contingent from the University of Melbourne. And I think I might be standing between <coughs> you and lunch. Um, so uh, thank you for hearing me out. I will speak again briefly on, on this at other times. Or if you have any questions, please come and ask me. Um, but, you know, remember the third issue in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, truth-telling. Our children deserve the truth. Why bring them up with lies? Thank you. Thank you.